You know, when I was getting dressed this morning, hit the weather out on my phone, and was a little discouraged at how low that temperature number was. Because wasn't it just about a week ago that we hit 90? And I would love to have that back. I don't know about you, but I wasn't ready to have to pull the, the old sweater heavy covering back out again. I'm looking forward to, to a real spring and some real warmth. That means summer's coming. And that makes me a happy camper. I don't know about you, but that's just me. Um, and so I have no idea why I'm telling you that, other than to say that that's not the spring breakthrough that we're talking about. Is we're talking about this idea of a spring breakthrough, that, that Jesus Christ has come to be the breakthrough to the chains that hold us down in bondage, in fear, in worry, in financial struggles, in temptations, you name it. And last week we talked about addictions and, and how easy it is for us to, to take the word addiction and lump it into a very small category that, well, that only means, you know, drugs and alcohol and gambling, you know, all, all the bad stuff that they talk about in church. But what we understood is that an addiction is really anything that I want to stop doing that I can't. And when we understand addiction through that light, we find ourselves all rowing the same boat in some fashion. And Jesus Christ has come to set us free from those addictions. And today we're going to continue this series and we're going to talk about anxiety today. Worry and anxiety. And uh, it's a very important topic. It's something that scripture speaks very clearly and plainly about. But before I, I go any further, I need to make this very, very clear. Very clear, not just to you in the room, but to those of you on our live stream, to somebody that might be watching this message weeks or even months later uh, online somewhere. Please hear my heart and hear these words when I say this today. When we're talking about worry and anxiety today, I am not talking about clinically diagnosed anxiety disorders. That is a whole different ball game, okay? And so I know for people who struggle with a true anxiety disorder, hearing the pastor, hearing to talk about anxiety already makes you anxious. Because most likely, what you have heard from well-meaning church people in your life is that even though you're battling anxiety, you just, you know, you just need to pray about it. As though it's a magic switch, right? And then you prayed, and, and an answer didn't come in the way you'd hoped, and so you've been discouraged. And you've even kind of written off the church and written off Jesus because of it. I want you to know this today, church. It's okay to have Jesus and a therapist too. you got to know that. It is okay to have Jesus and a therapist too. So today, if you are struggling with a panic disorder, if you struggle with social anxiety disorder or some kind of major depressive uh, mental illness, if you have phobic disorders or even stuff like OCD or, or PTSD, Please know there may be some nuggets of this in the practical sense that you too can take and, and implement into your own life. But when we're talking about worry and anxiety today, we're talking just about the run-of-the-mill, regular worry and anxiety stuff that plagues everyone, not those who might be struggling with mental illness, all right? So with all of that said, Let's look at the Word of God today. We're going to check out Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, this is by the way Jesus talking, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you 
not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you, of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. There was a study done by some guy with a really long name and a whole bunch of letters after it, signifying all the degrees he had earned. He done a study on this idea of worry and anxiety, and it's, uh, it's been attributed to multiple people, which is why I'm referring to it in a vague way. I get conflicting information as to who actually generated this study and this report, but the statistics are still the same, no matter who actually created the study. But I think it's very interesting for us to take a look at this today. Statistics on, some, on worry and anxiety. First one. 40% of the things that we worry about never happen. And some of us are giggling because we know exactly what that's like, right? We have the conversations in our head, we plot the scenarios out. When they say this, I'm going to say that. And then we get there in front of people and they didn't say anything at all. And we worked ourselves up because it never even happened. 40%. Think about that for a second. That's almost half. Almost half of the things that plague us and cause us worry and anxiety never happen. It gets better. 30% concern the past. 30% concern the past. Anybody built a DeLorean time machine yet that's uh, been able to go back and fix the past? Not me, right? It's happened. We may not like it, it may have caused pain, there may be issues, other issues we have to work through in that, but worrying and causing ourselves anxiety about the past changes nothing. So here we are, 70% in of stuff that's not going to happen and has to do with the past. Unbelievable. 12% are needless worries about health. Now, for those that struggle with health issues, this almost sounds like a kind of a harsh statement, right? Because isn't our health, we, we should worry about our health in a, in a healthy way, right? We want to maintain our health and, and take good care of ourselves and, and make sure we're meeting all those doctor's appointments. But what this is ultimately referring to are those times when, when some of us, we, we have an itch or we have a pain somewhere and we start immediately going down worst case scenario, right? We did, uh, if, if you remember, there's a movie from like, this either the late 80s or the early 90s, and it was called Kindergarten Cop, okay? And Kindergarten Cop had Arnold Schwarzenegger in it. And the reason this is funny to us, it's very funny in our house, because every time Arnold in that movie got a headache, a little boy said it's a tumor, and he's like, it's not a tumor, right? That's, that's how that works, right? And so in our house, those of you that know, I, I had a brain tumor, and it was found because I had headaches. So this is like funny to us, right? So, but then understand what I'm saying is we, we get these little tiny things that come up. We, we make the foolish decision to go hop online and start Googling our symptoms and we end up on WebMD, and in case you don't know, everything on WebMD is cancer. Like, that's just, it's just it. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a splinter in your finger, but you're going to die, right? And that's how we end up acting as people, right? That's the kind of needless health worries that we're referring to. 
All right, here, 10% are about petty issues. Petty issues. Stuff that five years from now will mean absolutely nothing. I would even say stuff that five hours from now won't even matter anymore, right? But we worry about these, these petty issues, right? Now, last statistic, 8% of what this doctor called legitimate concerns, okay? Now, he didn't really specify what he considered legitimate. I'm not even going to get into all of that today. What I want us to do is some very quick math. If he says 8% are legitimate concerns, that means 92% of the things we worry about are pointless, have no purpose, accomplish nothing, are things we can't change, right? So we, as people, drive ourselves into this, this whole nonsense of, of anxiety and worry because, well, we do, right? We're sinful people. We need Jesus. We, we are constantly, each and every day, that's why Scripture tells us to die to self, right? There's more of me that needs to die today so that there can be more of Jesus to come into that place. All of us are rowing that boat. So what is anxiety? Okay, this is, we got to talk about this because what kind of a definition are we going to work with if we're not talking about true mental illness and, and actual disorders? What are we talking about then? So a, a very generic dictionary type of definition for anxiety, distress about future uncertainties. Okay? That's a very vague but still all-encompassing idea of what anxiety that we're talking about means. Now, let's get into the Greek on this. Okay, the word, in case you didn't know, the New Testament, which we just read from, was originally written in Greek. And so there are many times that the English language is lacking. Okay, uh, if you know anybody in your life that speaks another language, then you can ask them how absolutely awful the English language is, right? The Greek language is beautiful, it's fluid, and it has so much depth to it. And so there's times when we go look at the original definition of the Greek words, we find something there that gives us an even better idea of what that word means. And this Greek word that's used for, for anxiousness, for anxiety, is called merenna. Okay, that's how it's pronounced, and it means to be anxious or to have a distracting care. And if you've ever been worried, if you've ever been anxious, a distracting care is most ultimately like the perfect word structure of what you're dealing with. Because you care about it, it's, it's very deep within you, but it is distracting as all get out. It shows back up when you don't want it to. It takes your focus away from all the other things that you wish you could focus on. So it's a distracting care. Now, the cool thing is this Greek word is actually made up of two Greek words when you look at the roots of them all. And those two words, when put together, mean a divided mind. A divided mind. So as we're talking about worry and anxiety, what we're ultimately talking about is how our minds are divided against even itself, right? We have this urge to, to, to do what's right, as we talked about last week, but I can't because I'm focused on this thing over here. I, I don't want to worry about this thing over here, but, but oh my, all I can think about is this thing over here. And so and my mind is divided constantly. I feel like I'm arguing with myself internally all day long when I'm really struggling with worry and anxiety. And so that's our definition and that's how we're looking at it. And what we can ultimately conclude here is that anxiety is really a reaction to our circumstances. It's a reaction to our circumstances. So church, I want to submit this to us today, that if we want to see a breakthrough in our reactions, then what we have to do is come to the one who is bigger than our circumstances. And that's how we're going to see a breakthrough in our lives in the world of anxiety. 
And some of you might be thinking to yourself, by the time we got done reading these scriptures today, you're like, this is crazy. This is impossible. That text said to never be anxious. It said, don't worry. You don't understand what's going on in my life. You don't know the circumstances that I'm dealing with today. You don't realize everything that's waiting for me tomorrow morning. But I want you to hear this. It's one thing to have an anxious moment when you hear about or learn about a circumstance of life, loss of a job or no money in the checking account, family problems, everyday school life issues. But the reason Jesus is bringing this to our attention is because what he's trying to get us to do is make a decision on what are we going to do about it. When those moments come, what are we going to do about it? Jesus knows that life is hard. I promise you, Jesus knows. Jesus knows the circumstances that come our way, that they're very difficult, that they're very trying. Jesus himself, we just celebrated Easter a few weeks ago. Before Jesus was led out uh, and, and betrayed and taken and arrested and, and nailed to the cross, he was in the garden and he was praying. But get this. Jesus was so completely overwhelmed with anxious and nervous feelings because he knew what was coming. The scripture said he began to sweat drops of blood. But what did Jesus do about it? He prayed to the Father and he said, if this cup can pass for me, that would be fantastic. <laughs> but not my will. Your will be done. Jesus wants us to know that it's not his will for us to live in anxiety, to set up camp in worry. He doesn't want that for us. He has a much better life for us than that. When we're anxious and we're worried, this means ultimately that we're living a life less than God intended for us. When we're anxious and, and worried, we're not living the life that Jesus promised to give us, that abundant life. Instead, we end up living a life that's really lacking and pretty insufficient. And so what I want to share with us today is that I believe it's the lacking that causes our anxiety. So let's look into this today. What causes our anxiety? Let's go back to the first one, which was lack of understanding our worth. Okay? What causes anxiety? The lack of understanding of our worth. What did the text read for us? Verse 25 and 26. Look at the birds in the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? See, when we don't understand who we are, what ends up happening is that we try to impress everybody else. We try to live up to everybody else's standards and expectations. We try our best to keep everybody happy. Is anybody else anxious at that very thought right now? You know how exhausting that is. See, we, we try to earn our worth by, by working harder and working longer than everybody else. We try to buy our worth when we shower gifts upon people because we hope and we pray that that means that they will like us more, like us better than they do. We perform our religious duties hoping that we can get enough God points so that Jesus will love us more and that we'll, he'll let us into heaven when we die. We do things like this when we're trying to gain our worth from the wrong sources. Jesus already told us, he's hinting at our value in those very verses. 
We know that our worth is great. Why? Because Jesus Christ, he came and he bled and he died and he rose again for us. That's how we know our worth. That's how we know our value. You are worth dying for. You are worth saving. You are worth loving. And you are worth being entrusted with his mission here on earth. You have to know your value. And the moment you do, the worry and the anxiety and the pressure that you put upon yourself to create some pseudo self-worth out here begins to go away. Here's the second thing that causes our anxiety. Lack of being in control. <laughs> this one's my favorite. Lack of being in control. Has anybody here, I, I'm serious, show of hands, and if you're on our live stream, you can leave a comment for us if this, if this is you today. Have you ever worried yourself into a better situation? <laughs> I'm not seeing any hands here, and I'm looking down at, at our media team here in the front. They're not telling anybody's comment on that one either, right? And here, here's a second question. Has anybody here or on our live stream, have you ever had a doctor tell you that because you have worried so incredibly much, you just added five years to your life? <laughs> no, no, right? Check this out. This is all, it's all about control, isn't it? I'm a dad. I have two amazing boys. They're 15 and they're 10. And, and, and I love them to pieces. And, and Wyatt, Wyatt is driving now because he was he's old enough to have his permit. Um, he's old enough now to claim the second car as his car. That's funny. Because <laughs> I haven't seen any money yet. I'm just, I'm just saying. But he's driving, right? And, and Jennifer has been doing the absolute bulk the absolute bulk of doing the driving time with him. Why? Because I need Jesus in this area of my life. He's a great kid. He does a great job. I mean, I'm not bragging on him because he's my kid. I'm telling you, he's doing a great job driving. The problem is, when I go with him, I have no brake pedal. I have no steering wheel on my side, and it drives me nuts. It is so, I just want to be able to be in control. Letting that go and trying to trust the instruction, trust his upbringing, knowing all the failures that we've done there, right? All of that is hard. It's hard to let go of control in all kinds of areas of our life, but I'm an anxious, nervous wreck that I created myself sitting in the passenger seat when he's trying to drive. And what does that end up becoming? Contagious. Then I can make him nervous and anxious and worried, and then he's gonna do something he wouldn't do. He'll make a mistake, he'll lose focus, He'll do whatever because I brought that to the table as well. Lack of control. We worry and we get anxious when changes come to our lives because we feel like we've lost control. That's the ultimate issue. I've lost control over this. I don't know what I'm going to do next. I don't know what this is going to look like. And so we create all kinds of anxiety and worry in our lives. We, you, we can see this in practical ways because we start to micromanage everything when we're anxious and worried. We, we, we start to become untrusting of people in our lives. We, we completely overwhelm ourselves and our calendars because we have to do everything ourselves 
all because we have to have the sense of control. There was a cheesy movie a while back called Days of Thunder, where Tom Cruise, uh, this, it's a cheesy movie. You can watch it if you're all about cheese, but it was a cool. Tom Cruise was a NASCAR driver. That all by itself is pure comedy. But Tom Cruise was a NASCAR driver in this movie. And Nicole Kidman was the doctor that saved his life after this big nasty crash. And of course, it's a movie, so she becomes his love interest about halfway through, right? And she asked him one day, why in the world do you get in a car and go 200 miles an hour you know, and, and, and what is it about that that's just so intriguing to you? And his response was control. I, I, I like the feeling of being able to control something that's out of control. A little bit later in the movie, Tom makes a mistake in his love interest relationship. And I don't know why this quote sticks in my head, but I can never get it out. Nicole Kidman later in that movie looks back at Tom Cruise and she said, you said you want to control things. Control is an illusion, you infantile egomaniac. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that'll preach all day long, right? Holy cow, she's talking to me, you infantile egomaniac. When we get that that need for control, we're making it all about us. And church, I gotta tell you, control is an illusion. We just sing to the one who's in control. We worship the one who is in control. We have none. And we've gotta to come to grips with that very, very soon. All right, here's the other thing. What causes anxiety? Lack of faith. Go ahead and go to the next one. We'll skip that. And that's just repeating what I already said. Lack of faith. Lack of faith causes anxiety. And here's the text on that one. I think. Oh, sorry. That's okay. That's all right. Uh, and this is again, 20, verses 28 and 30. Why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field, they don't labor or spin. I tell you, not even Solomon. And by the way, Solomon was king. In the Old Testament, Solomon, Solomon had everything. If you want to talk about rich, it was Solomon, right? And so that's why they're referring to him here. And all of his splendor wasn't dressed like the fields. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you you of little faith, right? You of little faith. Our lack of faith so often causes us to worry and be anxious because we, we ultimately lack a, a trust in God. We, we, we lack a, a trust in his provision. We, we lack a trust in, in his sovereignty. We, we lack trust in his guidance and direction. And when we feel overwhelmed, with anxiety and worry, we end up taking our eyes off of Jesus and focusing squarely on our circumstances. We end up telling God how big our circumstances are rather than telling our circumstances how big our God is. You see, when we focus on Jesus, it's actually an opportunity to increase our faith. Focusing on Christ will actually cause your faith to increase. Now you might be in here today saying, well, I, Pastor, I've got to be honest, my, my faith is a little low today. And I totally get it. Understand where you're coming from. I have been there before. But what I want to remind you is that Jesus himself told his disciples, and that means us, that if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we can move mountains. See, it's, it's, it's about Christ. Yes, it's our faith in him, but he's still in control. He's still doing all the work. We don't have to have faith in the results. We've got to have faith in him. 
See? So even if you came in here today, or if you're watching today, and you are on just finite particle level of faith, you can still move mountains when you focus your eyes on Jesus and allow him to grow that within you. See, when you come to Jesus Christ and as your Lord and, and your Savior, you get this awesome free gift called the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit of God himself. And when that Holy Spirit comes and lives within you, he's changing you and producing what Scripture refers to as the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the fruit that's coming from you by the Holy Spirit living within you. And church, as that fruit continues to grow, and you experience Jesus more and more and more, your faith will increase, and guess what? It's all grace. It's all grace. There's an old song that said, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I've proved him over and over. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. You see, faith is grace. God will take whatever you bring to the table and do something miraculous with it. Just bring what you have and ask for the grace of God to increase your faith. Our prayer team this morning prayed, and, and we referred to the gentleman that was on the side of the road that Jesus was talking to, him, and, and, and he said, I believe, he's talking to Jesus, he said, I believe, help my unbelief, right? That's what we're talking about. I believe a little bit, but I got some doubts, so help that part. I've got a little bit of faith, God, but I need some more, right? That's the God we serve. That's why we can come to him with our worries and our anxieties, because he will meet us there and ultimately increase our faith. Here's the last one. Lack of proper priorities. That causes anxiety, too. And here's what the text said to us. Don't worry. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Pagans. Or not after all of those things. Your Heavenly Father knows you need them, but seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And then all the other stuff will be given to you as well. Seek first the kingdom. This is what it means to make Jesus the subject. Again, it's not a catchphrase, it's not a slogan. It's the call of God to his people. Make Jesus the subject. That means I care about what he cares about. That means I'm doing what he's asking of me. It means I'm looking at life, at things, at people, all through the eyes of Jesus Christ. I'm in a life-transforming relationship with him. We are close and getting closer each and every day because I'm making him the subject of every piece of my day. I'm actually allowing Jesus to not just be my Savior, but I'm allowing him to be my Lord. You see, understand this. When Jesus is Lord, that means you and I are not. When Jesus Christ is Lord, you and I are not. See, we're not seeking first our own kingdoms. We're not seeking first our desires. We're not seeking first our dreams. Instead, we're seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, his plans, his dreams. And when we do that, he promises to give us all that we question is, how do I do this? Sounds really good. It's exciting. Makes sense. But what do I do about it? 
How can I defeat anxiety and worry that seems to continually well up within me? So here's the first thing I want to tell us as we think about how to conquer anxiety. The last verse from chapter, uh, that we're looking at today. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So how do we get rid of anxiety? Stop trying to live tomorrow today. Stop trying to live tomorrow today. We start fretting about tomorrow. We're worrying about things that might happen this week. We're getting anxious about what the future looks like. And we then in turn put those statistics we started with right back into play. Okay? Instead, we should be basking in the glories and the blessings of God that we're already receiving today. See, I don't have to worry about tomorrow because I know that Jesus is already there. And he's never, ever going to lead me further than his reach of his grace, his love, his mercy, his guidance, his protection, his provision, and his direction. See, I don't know what tomorrow might hold, but I do know one who holds my hand today. And his name is is Jesus. I don't have to live tomorrow, today. I'll let Jesus worry about that one. We're going to look at uh, Philippians chapter 4 very quickly for the remainder of this today. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, which simply just means when God's peace showed up, it makes absolutely no sense at all. Right? That peace will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So choose joy. If you want to conquer anxiety, choose joy. And you're saying, are you kidding me? <laughs> you want me to rejoice always. You want me to be joyful all the time. Well, when trouble comes my way, <laughs> my first thoughts are not usually about experiencing great joy. Right? I'm not, I'm not that guy. I'm not that lady. That's not me. I understand. Maybe your typical reaction is more along the lines of fear panic, or worry, or even hopelessness. At the very least, you're saying here today, I reserve the right to gripe and complain and moan about my troubles, <laughs> right? But the scripture said to choose joy. Rejoice always in all circumstances. We are to be joyful. Kay Warren said it like this. She said, joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life. The quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right. And the determined choice to praise God in all things. So each day when I wake up, I have to make a choice. Am I going to let external circumstances cause me unnecessary grief? worry and anxiety or am I going to choose to get out of bed with joy because I know that Jesus Christ is still on the throne because I know that Jesus is still watching over me because I know that, that Jesus has a plan and a purpose for my life because the mercies of Jesus are new every single morning even if everything that can go wrong today, goes wrong today, I have been saved because of his death and his resurrection. I choose joy. Here's the second one. I'm sorry, the third one. Prayer and petition. The text said prayer and petition. You know, oftentimes we think petition is the, the only form of prayer. 
that we, we give our list of stuff to God, we say amen, and good job. We had a successful prayer moment. Very meaningful time of prayer. I said what I had to say. I said, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Check. Check. But I want to submit that that's a pretty short-sighted way to look at all of this. Because we see in this text, prayer and petition are listed as two separate things. Two separate things. See, talking to God and, and sharing our concerns, our feelings, our circumstances, that's all part of this. But there's an implication here that we're also to sit and be quiet as we wait on Him to speak to us. Psalm 62, verse 5. Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in Him. It says, all that I am. Let all that I am. That means my worries and my, my anxieties too. All that I am. I'm to wait quietly because you know what? It takes time to calm the mind and to calm the heart. It takes forever sometimes. <clears throat> if you've ever tried it, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you struggle with this each and every night you go to bed. Your head hits the pillow and the tape starts running of everything that's coming up tomorrow. All the stuff that still didn't get done today. Oh shoot, did I make the kids lunch? You know, all and on and on and on and on. It takes forever for you to fall asleep because it took forever for your mind to quiet. Remember, prayer is a conversation with the Lord. It's a conversation. Have you ever talked with somebody who is really worried and anxious and stressed? And I, you just know it. You can see it on their face. You can see it in their, their body language. And you can most definitely tell because they won't shut up. I don't mean it as a hateful thing. I'm just saying, when we get nervous and anxious for many people, the mouth just starts going 100 miles an hour because that's how that anxiety is, is manifesting itself in us. It's how it's, it's coming out. They just keep talking and talking and talking. And can't get a word in edgewise, can you? I wonder sometimes if Jesus feels the same way. When we're anxious, when we're worried, we just keep talking, trying to fill the dead space, trying to fill the dead space. I like another thought, another thought, another thought, another thought. And Jesus is just kind of going, let me know when you're done. Right? Jesus is not a rude God. He'll, he'll, he'll wait his turn. Right? But when we come to Jesus with all of the words ourselves, he can't get a word in edgewise. But here's what we need, right? We, we want to hear from Jesus. We need to hear from him. After all, it was Jesus who told the wind and the waves in a nasty storm. He simply spoke two words, be still. And the wind and the waves obeyed the words of Jesus Christ. That's why our text says that if we do these things, the peace of God will guard our hearts and our minds. Any anxious, worried people out there need some peace, some true peace? Be thankful. That's the next one. Be thankful. This can be in prayer. This can be shared with somebody else. This can be you talking to yourself while you're doing dishes. It doesn't matter. But be thankful in those moments of worry and anxiety. It's okay to say, I know my family is causing me worry and anxiety, but I'm thankful to have family. I know my job is causing me stress and anxiety, but I am thankful to have employment. I know I don't totally understand the world I live in today, but I'm thankful to be able to share Jesus Christ with another generation. 
God, I don't know what's going on with my health, but I am thankful for the gift of medicine. I'm thankful for another day. I'm thankful for the reminder that I need to depend on you, Jesus, for every step I take, every ounce of breath that is in my lungs. I am thankful. And when we trade our worries and our anxieties for thankfulness, watch what begins to happen in you. So as we close today, I'm going to leave us with some questions. What are you not trusting God for? What's that thing that you're thinking of right now that's causing you worry and anxiety? That if you're honest, has just simply been, I don't know if I've been trusting God in that circumstance. Second question. Are your priorities those of Jesus and his kingdom? When our priorities are out of whack, everything starts to fall apart. Are you willing to give up control in order to receive the peace of Jesus? You have a choice to make. Do you want control or do you want the peace of God that passes all understanding? And then finally, Will you allow Jesus to be the breakthrough you've been looking for? I believe with all of my heart that all of us in some way, shape, or form battle worry and anxiety. We all need Jesus to be our breakthrough somewhere in this aspect of our lives. And it's scary. I need to say humbling because we have to admit it and that's hard but here's what I want you to know about Jesus 1st Peter chapter 5 verse 7 cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you Jesus Christ never intended you to live a life of worry and anxiety He's big enough, strong enough, powerful enough to deal with all of our circumstances. Will you choose today to cast them onto him, to let go of them today and give them to Jesus so that he might be the breakthrough in your life? <coughs> Lord, we are so thankful for this word that you've given us today. We, we humbly admit that worry and anxiety is often a part of our lives. <clears throat> Increase our faith in you. Increase our focus on you. Help us to do things like be joyful in all circumstances to recognize the blessings that you've poured out on us so that we can be thankful even in the midst of an anxious moment. Lord, there are people in this room, people on our live stream today who need your peace. And that's our prayer for them today. That through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would touch them that they would relinquish control and relinquish the circumstances. Receive with joy and excitement your peace, true peace, peace that is lasting. Holy Spirit, have your way in us and through us. And may you be praised, O God for the work you're doing in our minds and in our hearts today. Amen. And these altars are here for you if you'd like to come pray. If you want to pray alone, come to my right. If you need someone to pray with you, come to my left. But take advantage of the opportunity today as the Lord is speaking.
possible sale of uh, part of some acreage here on our property. So we have some information we want to share with you about all of that. And then also want to let you know, I was made aware of this this morning, and it sounds like fun, uh, on Saturday, meaning this coming Saturday at 9 a.m., if you love to play in the dirt and work with flowers and landscaping, We've got a great day for you planned. It's just going to be a few hours. Uh, there's no super heavy lifting uh, that's going to be involved. But, uh, but Vicki, Vicki, would you raise your hands for those that may not know who you are? There's Vicki back there. You can find Vicki out in the lobby for more information and to let her know that you're coming. But we're going to be cleaning up some of the flower beds and things on Saturday. And we would love for you, if you're able and willing, to come and be a part of that Saturday at 9 a.m. There will be donuts. There are, that's it, right there. She said, there will be donuts, and all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, well, church, you are loved, and you are dismissed. Thank you.